We're going to get started. I had another piece that I wanted to offer about what it meant to be hopeful in this time, but I'm going to postpone that. I want to have, because of a couple of the conversations we were having, I want to close the loop on something else, and we'll come back to the hopeful thing on Sabbath later on, okay? Y'all remember that we were talking about what do we do in response to the fact that the church as we know it is calibrated for a world that no longer exists? And the beginning you heard a quote from a, uh, a lecture that I often give where it talks about how in innovation, the solution to the problem is just abandon the past and start all over again. We can't do that. We are inextricably and joyously tied to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We will never abandon that. So what does it mean to go forward without abandoning the past? And so what I want to do is I want to give you a real-life, current example of what that looks like. And then what I want to talk to you about, about is how one group worked on that. And then we'll kind of use that as a model for the rest of the day. So I want to start with a woman named Gina. She happens to be a computer programmer. She could easily have been the janitor who cleaned the, the, the building she was in. Or she could have been uh, instead a teenager talking to a friend uh, uh, at work. Or it could have been uh, that she was a couple of older folks sitting at a Dunkin' Donuts. But in this particular case, she was a computer programmer. And she sat in a little, one of those little cubicles. You know what that's like when you've got all these programmers in a cubicle. And across, the cubicle across from her, there was a young man named Tran. And he, uh, he, his parents were uh, immigrants from Vietnam. And his parents had sacrificed an awful lot in order for him to be here and to be able to have gotten a college degree and now to have gotten this first job out of college. But the problem was, he confessed to, to Gina that he experienced life as pretty lonely and sad. And he felt isolated from his family. He felt unloved. And he felt alone. And so at some point, which was totally appropriate to their relationship, she told him about the fact that you don't have to experience this unloved and loneliness. And she told him about the gospel. She told him about, a, uh, about Jesus who came and lived and died and rose again. She told about the Holy Spirit that binds us together. She told him about the church where she can come and be with others like that. Okay, and let's say she does that in the most winsome way. And he hears that. And he doesn't experience it as good news. What he says is, you know, much of that is really good. But that whole thing about death, that seems a little morbid for today. Can't we tell a story about Jesus that doesn't really talk about death? And you're going, no, 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 no that's not one of our options. Um, the life, death, and resurrection will never change. Now, if she had been a secular innovator... What she would have heard is, oh, my customer is telling me they want a new gospel. A gospel that doesn't talk about all the messiness of death and the shame of crucifixion. So what we'll do is we'll come up with a better gospel, one that doesn't have to talk about death and resurrection. That's not one of our options. Okay, that is what some people are doing, but can we in this room agree that we're inextricably and happily tied to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, now what do you do? This is what I want to talk about. Because what I want to suggest for us is that what we don't need to do is change the gospel. But what we do need to do is help change how we talk about it. Because we've been talking about it the same way for so long that we're no longer giving people something that they want to hear. He, the gospel was created just for people like him. And if we can't find a better way to tell that story, 
we are not doing our jobs. So I want to tell you a story. Well, before I do that, I want to tell you about, uh oh, I had, a, I had an eraser here. I must have lost it. Oh, look at that. Now, I thought I was going to have to write on the whiteboard, but in this particular case, enough of you have the book, I might just point you to a page number. Um, do you mind if I open your book? It's your, well, it's your, it's your book, but, you know. If you go to page eight, what I want to do is I want to give you five questions you can ask. Now, here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to be the guy who's the president of the ball bearing company and say, here are five easy steps you can follow. And if you follow these steps, I can guarantee an outcome. What I want to be is my grandfather, the citrus farmer. What did my grandfather know? He, he could know that he couldn't guarantee his trees would grow, but he could guarantee they would die. All he'd had to do is just never water them. You know, don't give them any water at all, and lo and behold, they would die. So what he had is a series of options, things he knew he could do, but he couldn't guarantee. I want to give you five questions. And we're going to work through those five questions over the course of today. And you're going to use those questions whenever you want to say to yourself, now what is it that we can do? Basically, you're saying, whenever I get stuck, what do I do? I want to suggest this is where you go back to. Now, I'm going to name the questions now. And what you're going to say is you go, I'm not sure I understand all those questions. That's OK. We're going to have a conversation about them um, in a few minutes. But I want you to see these questions exist. And then I'm going to tell you, I want to give you an example of how we've used them in the past. Um, this book here was written in 2015. But it wasn't published until 2020. Why not? Because in between, we road tested it. You know, oftentimes what scholars do is they write a book, and they send it off to the publisher, and that's that. Well, that wasn't good enough. And um, Michael mentioned the Fuller Youth Institute. I do a lot of work with the Fuller Youth Institute. And this project that uh, Michael's doing is part of a innovation grant that um, the Lilly Endowment's given to, what, 13 different schools, something, 13 different groups, something like that. My school's one of them. And it, this one's on innovation for vocation. But we, the original one was on innovation for youth ministry, and then one on innovation with young adults. And the young adults and the youth ministry uh, innovation, that's where we road tested this. So we road tested this book with over 100 congregations. And what we would do is gather them together for an event like we would do today. Um, and we would have a summit. And we'd have the people do preparation where they would have to um, uh, do a lot of listening in advance. We'll talk about that. And by the end of the day, they would have a prototype that they could go back and try new things in their church. We're not doing all of that. We actually, I think, might have thought about doing that if it weren't the pandemic. It, you know, once upon a time, we first started this conversation. That was, I think, where we were headed. But doing all of that during the pandemic was going to be just too much for you. So we shifted gears. But I want to tell you the story of one person that came to one of those events. Her name was Erica. Uh, she was a youth minister at a church in Florida. And it was a church that was mostly made up of older adults. 60 was considered kind of young, um, mostly 70s and 80-year-olds. I, I, I know none of you know churches that are like that. but. Per, you know, just take your churches and pretend 40 years from now that's what they're like, right? Um, but she had a youth group. And the youth group was made up mostly of middle schoolers. But they were middle schoolers whose parents were not part of this church. Now, I got to tell you, I have an enormous respect for anybody that works with middle schoolers. I think middle school is the hardest time in life. Um, I think of it as a town in the desert that no one wants to live in, but you have to pass through it on the way between two good things. 
we have a town in, in, in LA called Barstow that is between, halfway between LA and Vegas. And you, know, you drive through there. I said, being in middle school is like being in Barstow. I had a guy come to me afterwards. He goes, I'm a middle school teacher in Barstow. <laughs> <laughs> But what she did is she listened to her people. You see, one of the first sets of questions is about leadership begins with listening. And we're going to talk in a little bit about what that means to listen. She listened to her people. And she listened to those young people. And they found, she found that they believed a lot of things about themselves that were lies. Among other things, they believed that if God really knew me, God wouldn't like me. And so I have to hide myself from God. And they believed things like, if God really, <clears throat> excuse me, in this day and age, the worst thing I could do is sneeze on you, right? <laughs> um, that if my peers knew me, they wouldn't like me. And if my parents knew what I was really thinking, they wouldn't approve. And so she wanted to figure out what to say to them. And she realized that the gospel response to them was lament. God can handle your honesty. Now, the problem is, what are you going to do when you turn to a bunch of middle schoolers and go, I'm going to teach you about the biblical practice of lament. <laughs> that's, you know, that's not going well at all. So we worked together, and she said, she's going to have to reinvent the practice of lament for these middle schoolers. But one of the things that we talked about when we were working on this is that, you know, those of you who have been to seminary, maybe those of you who haven't, know about there's this thing called form criticism. There's this idea that stuff comes in structure, and the structure communicates something. I'll give you an example. Let's say I got a letter from my bank, and it said, Dear Scott, would I immediately go, wow, my bank loves me. The only person in my entire life that calls me dear is my beloved grandmother. They love me as much as my grandmother loves me. Why else would they say dear? And then at the end they send, say sincerely, so clearly they were telling me that they sincerely hold me. Is that what my bank was trying to communicate? That's what the word said. The form communicates the idea, right? It's called a form letter. Well, in the same way, biblical laments have form. They have structure. They have pieces of them. And the form is important because it'll keep you from getting 40 years in the wilderness. You see, because part of a lament is called the complaint. And there, this is a complaint that God invites. There, for those of you who have read the book of Numbers, know that there are times when there's another kind of complaint, we'll call it grumbling, that will get you 40 years in the wilderness. So if you're going to complain, you should be clear on the difference between grumbling and the kind of complaint that God invites. And that's where form criticism comes in. Because as part of the complaint that God invites, there is always a statement of trust. I trust you enough that I can tell you honestly what's going on and what I am experiencing. You can imagine the kind of statement of trust that says, I trust you that I, enough that I can be honest with you. That's a statement of trust. There's other kinds of complaints that's like, I've just stopped trusting you and I'm just going to whine. That's called grumbling. So what she wanted to do was figure out, how do I put form criticism in with middle schoolers? How do I make sure that their complaining is the kind that leads them to want to trust? And now we're back to planting language. So... Turn in your hymnals. Um, a couple of more pages. Do you mind if I look and see which page? No, I skipped it. 
if you turn to page 12, what you're going to see is she said, part of almost every middle school's experience, middle schooler's experience is this thing called Mad Libs. Anybody remember Mad Libs? You know, you're in middle school and you know, they, they, they read you, okay, give me a noun. And, they say, you know, and then they read a story and it's all very funny because they inserted all these words. So they're used to this Mad Libs structure. So she created a Mad lib structure for lament. And she had four questions that she, she gave them a little piece of paper like this big and little golf pencils, you, remember, you know, and she said, okay, fill in, God, I don't understand blank. God, please fix blank. God, I will trust you with my future even if blank. And God, I will praise you even when blank. And she knew that you couldn't just turn to a middle schooler and say, tell me your deepest, darkest secrets. So what she did is the first week they worked on this, she simply said, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Let's just write about stuff that's far away, a flood in India or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, you know, something, it just, and she gave them a way to just be not very personal about it. And they wrote about that. And they did that for a week or two. And then, then she said, okay, now you can write about something, you know, you know, maybe a little closer. And, you know, so somebody, you know, please heal my grandmother. Or, you know, my friend's dog is sick. Or, you know, whatever it was. Something that was, again, not that inside of them. But they got used to the structure. And then what'd she do? She said, after a few weeks of that, she turned to him and said, okay, now I want you to write what's going on inside of you. What are you thinking? And you don't have to let anybody else read this. If you want me to read it, I will, but your name's not going to be on it. But I want you to be able to write out what you're really thinking about. And they would do that. And most of them actually then gave it to her, and she, she prayed about it. Well, something strange happened. Remember I told you that these were kids whose parents were not part of the church. The parents came and said, what's going on with my kid? Whatever it is you're doing, it's working. And they told her about this, and they said, we want a piece of that. So they ended up having an, a Wednesday night where the parents came, and the young people led them in a service of lament for the parents. And they filled the little things out like that. Well, Remember, this is still kind of isolated from the older people in the church. Well, the er older people in the church heard about it and said, we want a piece of that. And so eventually the middle schoolers came and they led a service of lament in the church on a Sunday morning for all these 70s and 80-year-olds talking about the things that, that they held dear. And what happened? It changed her ministry. It changed her ministry because all of a sudden, the, peop the young people were willing to be honest with her. And they were willing to be honest with God. And the moment they started being honest with her and with God, they could really address the stuff that's going on. How many of you were once children? <laughs> you all remember what it's like to be in middle school and how the very last thing you want is for somebody to figure out how hard it is for you. And now all of a sudden there's a place where not only can you express how hard it is, but it turns out so is everybody else. And Jesus is there to love you in the midst of it. What we're looking for in the way that we plant language is something that leads people into a new way of seeing Jesus. And that's what we're going to spend most of the rest of today working on. So, let me pause there and say, I, I talked for a little bit. Anybody want to say something? Any got questions, comments, rebukes, rebuttals? You were all talking earlier, and so I'm a little worried that, you know, I, I, I have subdued you. So, we have about an hour until lunch. And so, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take up the first two of the questions that you've got there. Maybe even if we get a chance to talk a little about the third. So the questions, I think, are on page eight. The first question is this. 
Who are the people entrusted to your care? And what I want to do is I want to suggest to you that leadership begins with listening. That's not the stereotype. The stereotype is that the purpose of leadership is to speak. And I'm guessing that most of you will be called to speak at times. But what happens if I encounter somebody? Can I just pick you as an example? I forgot your name already. Lynn. Lynn. If I just walk up to Lynn and I start talking to her, and we have had about a minute and a half of conversation, and I just start speaking. I don't know anything about her, so what do I have to do? I have to treat her like a stereotype. I just figure and guess whatever I can based on the uh, nonverbal cues, and I just assume all things about her. And probably some of them are true, and some of them are not true, and guess what? I just blunder along. If leadership be, does not begin with listening, you treat your people as a stereotype, and you, they do, don't feel heard. If you want people to feel heard, here's the best way to start. Start by listening. And then tell them what you heard. So for example, when I was a seminary student, I had a, um, an internship. And there was a husband and wife pastoral team that, was the, um, the, that I worked for. And when the wife was the one that would preach, she always started her sermon the exact same way. She would say, you know what it's like when, and then she would describe something. You know what it's like when you're hungry and you've still got more stuff to do, but dinner's still a ways off and you just get really impatient or, you know. And everybody goes, yeah, I know what that's like. Whatever it is, she would, she would always start with, you know what it's like when. And when people will go, yeah, I know what that's like, she had them. She, under, she got it and they got it. They thought she understands me. And so, what did I do today? What was the first thing I said to you? I'm tired and so are you. I had you. Because you understood that I understood you. I wasn't going to treat you like a stereotype. I had listened to the experience from listening to Michael and from other, and other pastors like you enough that I could say something. And if it hadn't resonated, I'd have found something else. I'd have spent a bunch of time listening. But immediately when I said that, I could see in your eyes that it resonated. Leadership begins with listening because the credibility you receive from your people will be based on how much they feel like you get me for who I am. And you know, we were talking a, a earlier about how do you take people where they don't want to go? Well, you take them where they don't want to go if, you can, if they really believe that you get me and we're working off of my terms, whatever it is. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. So leadership begins with listening. And I want to talk about who do we listen to, what do we listen for, and how do we listen well. Who do we listen to, what do we listen for, and how do we listen well? And for those of you keeping score at home, this is basically the substance of chapter three. Who do we listen to? I would argue that we listen to the people entrusted to our care. Now, I'm a leadership professor. You'd think that I would talk about followers. You will never hear me talk about followers. I don't believe Christian leaders have followers. Jesus has followers. But they don't follow us, they follow Jesus. And they are people that are entrusted to our care. And that changes everything. So who are the people entrusted to your care? Well, on the one hand, it's probably the people that are members of your, you know, you can show me roles and you can say that, you know, I've got names and that there's a membership process and, you know, I can tell you who these people are. And we can all agree, those are among the people entrusted to your care. But they are not the only people entrusted to your care. There are lots of other people entrusted to your care, people on, uh, in your community, people who kind of come to church, kind of don't. And i got to tell you that for a lot of the churches I'm working with right now, the question of who are the people entrusted to your care has become very complicated in this COVID world. 
because it used to be the definition of the people entrusted to my care is anybody that comes into our sanctuary on a Sunday morning. What if nobody came, but they showed up on this Zoom thing? Or they didn't show up on the Zoom thing, but they watched it later. Or they didn't watch it later, but their wife did, and, they told, and, and she told them about it. You know, what, what, who are the people entrusted to your care? That's a complicated question for you. And that's a question you're going to have to think through. Because I argue that it's probably one of the more important questions, because what accidentally happens is that people will often decide to privilege the wrong people. We will say, the only people that really matter in this conversation are, and then only listen to the people that are like the insiders. Again, I'm going to, oh, I've got a sociologist in the room. I'm about to quote a sociologist. I'm about to quote Mark Grinevetter. Am I allowed to do that in your presence? Okay. Um, there's a sociologist. Um, there's been studies that say, what are the top 10 articles that have made a difference in sociology in the last 20 years? And one of them is an article by Mark Grenovetter called The Strength of Weak Ties. Now, you don't know what that means. Let me explain. The question is, how do organizations grow? Or how do ideas propagate? How do they go out? And you would think it was because of the people that were most committed to it. And you'd be wrong. Let's pick somebody in my church. We'll call her Barbara. The reason we do that is because we have four Barbaras that are all among the very most committed people in our church. And all of Barbara's friends are members of the church. All of Barbara's work outside her home is with the church. She's probably at church four, four nights a week or four days a week. You, you know who I'm talking about? You've got the Barbaras in your church? Here's my question. Was Barbara make a very good evangelist? Well, not really. Who's Barbara know that's not a Christian? If, she, if you went and told her, I want you to invite all your friends to church, she turned to the people sitting in her pew and go, come to church with me. I mean, because the most committed, the people that are really on the inside, are so on the inside that they don't really have an experience of what it means to be on the outside. So who are the people that are going to help your, your church grow? Who are the people that are going to help ideas move throughout? It's what are called boundary spanners. It's people with one foot in and one foot out. Okay, can I answer a question? Can I, ask, can I finish this part and then I'll answer it? They're the ones that are going to talk to their friends. And, and I'm just going to leave. Which one do you want? We're supposed to be the boundary spreaders. The boundary spanners. Span we're supposed to be them. We all are. We all should have one foot in and one foot out. Yeah, but again, this is one of those things where I, I don't want to turn to Barbara and say, okay, what I think you need to do is stop being friends with the people in church and go find yourself some new friends. That's just, I, I can't really say that to her. I mean, which, which, which she's going to come back to me and say, so you want me to spend less time at church? I mean, you know. I think that's not nearly as useful to me as saying, who should I be listening to? I should focus my listening efforts not on the people that are on the most inside, but on the people that are on the periphery. You look like you don't buy it. I'm not saying I don't buy it. I, I just know that a lot of our churches are in the condition that they're in because they've been so inwardly focused that no one has been a boundary spreader, banner, and, well, and, that, and the reality is the people entrusted to our care should be those in the neighborhood around our church, and we've ignored them for too long. Okay, so can I, can I slightly reframe what you're about to say, what you just said? Because I agree with you. Yeah, because I'm sure I didn't say it well. Well, because, but the thing and the implication is you want to turn to the barbers of the world and say, you need to get out in the neighborhood. I'm not entirely sure that would work. And so here's what I think would work. It turns out most of our churches have a lot more people on the periphery than we thought they did. They're just the ones that, that don't stay very long. They're the ones that come and don't have a very good experience. And I want to suggest to you, this is something I was going to say a little bit later, but it's come up now. I want to distinguish for you between two things, between accommodation and assimilation. 
accommodation and assimilation. And accommodation and assimilation are about how do you treat somebody who's different than you are. Let's say, what's your, what's your name? It's Terrace. Let's say Terrace and I are friends. Or Terrace and I want to be friends, but Terrace and I are different. And one of us is going to have to change a little bit for us to be friends. If I'm someone who's interested in assimilation, what I'm going to say is, you need to, be, you need to change so you can be my friend. If I want to accommodate, I say, I will change so that I can be your friend. The question becomes, who's going to change? And this goes back to, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Joel. Joel. This goes back to Joel's point. What tends to happen in our churches is we have a bunch of insiders, and the moment we get somebody on the periphery, we say to them, we are, you are welcome to come into our church if you're willing to be just like us. And if you're not willing to be just like us, well, then you don't belong here. My pastor of the church, uh, you know, I've been going to the same church for about 25 years. And uh, my pastor for the first, I don't know, 17, 18 years of that, uh, he liked to say that it was really important to him that families be in church. But, okay, let's say you came and you brought your little daughter and your daughter's, you know, four-year-old starts crying in church. What happens? In lots of churches, you better get out of here. Here's what he would say to our church over and over again. We welcome kids in church, but we're not going to tell them they have to act like adults. And so, and he would say that maybe a dozen times a year. Just, you know... He would say, you know, during the welcome, we, you know, if you have kids, you're welcome, but we understand kids don't have to be like uh, um, adults, and if your kids cry, you don't have to need to feel like that, that you have to run away with them. They are welcome here. And he would be preaching, and some kid would cry, and he'd say, and I want to remind you that kids are welcome here, and they don't have to act like adults, and then he would just go on with the sermon. But here's the thing. He would accommodate those families, but he would say it over and over again, before anyone had ever cried. So that when the kid would cry, he was just reminding them of the language that he had already planted. So let me go back to, to, to me and accommodating my new friend. Now, let's say that you are a vegetarian. I don't know, I don't know you, maybe you are, maybe you're not. But Terrace is a vegetarian for this purpose. And let's say I invite Terrace to my house. Do I serve steak? No, 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 but you don't understand. When I was growing up, we never had steak. We just couldn't afford it. The only time you ever, ever, ever had steak was when my dad's boss came to dinner. It was the time when you had, the, you reserved it for the most honoring thing you could do. So the most honoring thing I could do, I want to show you the deepest honor, and so I'm going to serve you steak. Will Terrace feel honored? Well, whose fault is that? I was honoring you, and if you don't feel honored, that's on you. This is what we are. We are a church filled with steaks, uh, serving steak to vegetarians and complaining that they don't like it. Now, think about this the song that was often played in the 50s at every altar call. What was the song played in? Just as I am. You know, we are used to sing. <laughs> I was trying to be kind there. <laughs> but, you know, the idea that we have a language for saying just as I am. And the implication is you come just as you are, and then you have a conversion experience at the altar, and then, boy, you better never be the same again. And if you are, we're in accepting you. One of the things that I, so this whole idea about serving steak to, let me finish this. I mean, this whole idea of serving steak to vegetarians, I have told my own congregation that story at least four times. And every time I tell that story, they act like it's new. The problem is, is what happens is we, we pay attention to our intention. My intention was to serve you something that I find useful, I find honoring, 
and I didn't take the time to listen to you and do it on your terms. Yes, sir. But based on what you said, following... So part of the problem, though, is that if I just turn to people and I say to them, you should change, mm -hmm. they don't know how. But if instead I plant a language that they say, you know, I actually believe that you shouldn't serve steak to vegetarians. And you get them to live into that language a little. Or I know people in my church who really were annoyed every time a kid would cry. But every time that kid would cry, they would say to themselves, we don't expect kids to act like adults. And it gave them the language to live into being different. It gave them the language to live into being different. They, didn't, they weren't different the first four times it happened. But each time that it happened, they reminded themselves, and eventually over time, it got to the place where they were able to live into that. But you have to ask yourself, what has authority for them? And you have to, so who do you listen to? You listen to the people on the margins. I'm going to tell you one other group you listen to. So that you know what, you're, what the people that, uh, what the experience of the vegetarians in this, model, in this example are. But you also listen to the steak eaters to know what it means to be serving steak. And you've got to help them find a way to give an honoring meal that's not steak. There's one other group I suggest that you listen to. I'm going to call them tumbleweeds. God sometimes rolls people into your life whether you intended it or not. You know the, you know the old westerns where you see the tumbleweeds rolling across? You know. Well... I think that there's times God just rolls tumbleweeds into my life. Let me give you an example. I got a call one time from, or uh, email from my alma mater, the college where I went. And they said, we'd like to send somebody by to tell you about the school. Now, I knew this was a fundraising visit. And I had no interest in a fundraising visit. But I thought, you know, my school, the college or the um, university or the seminar where I teach, we're actually doing our own fundraising right now. It might be interesting to me to be on the other end of that to see what that's like. So yeah, I'll give the guy 45 minutes of my life so that I know that if I ever have to make some kind of a visit like this, I know what it's like. So he came and he talked to me. Yeah, that's fine. And he's about to leave and he looks around my office and he goes, boy, you got a lot of books. And I said, well, that's kind of what happens when you're a professor. And he goes, I see a lot of them seem to be about God. I said, yeah, that kind of happens. And he goes, do you mind if I ask you some questions about God? What is the only correct answer to that question? <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. I've got other things to do right now. Please don't talk to me about Jesus. And so he sat back down, and it turns out that he had a friend who'd been telling about Jesus. I'll remember, I'll remember his friend's name as long as I live. His friend's name was Bobo. I, didn't, I never met anybody named Bobo. But wherever Bobo is out there, he's an evangelist. And he was talking to this guy, and he was telling him about Jesus. And, he, and so the guy was asking me these questions like, is this really, you know, serious? Is this, this how it goes? And I could talk to him. And, we, you know, and at the end of about an hour, you know, we, we were already way past our scheduled time. Um, he said, this was really helpful. I said, well, if you ever want to come back and talk about Jesus, I, I'm good with that. And he goes, can I come back next month? Sure. And he comes back for uh, next month. And then he comes back the month after that. And he comes back the month. At some point, I had to realize this is somebody entrusted to my care. Yeah. I didn't go looking for him. I didn't intend for it. But God had rolled this person into my office. And I had just responded to what was in front of me. And it was now my responsibility. And over that time, between me and Bobo, and the Holy Spirit, um, yeah, me and Bobo planted and watered, and it's God that gave the increase. Over time, this guy started going to church, became a Christian, became baptized, joined a Bible study, all this stuff over the course of months. Now, eventually, he stopped being a person entrusted in my care when he applied for grad school and moved across country to, to a, a, another setting. But for that time, this was a person entrusted to my care. My wife has the same thing. Um, we moved uh, from 
further east away from Fuller to, um, to Pasadena um, about six years ago. And at that time, she joined uh, BSF, Bible Study Fellowship. Many of you know BSF. And um, goes to the first meeting, and that she's in a small group. They're about to end. And the small group leader says, there's a woman here who needs a ride home. She normally takes the bus. But if any of you happen to be driving past there, would you be willing to, to drive her? And she says, oh, where she live? She, oh, she lived right on Ginny's drive home. So Ginny says, I'll take her home. And she talked to her. Well, and then she picked her up the next week. Well, it turns out this woman has a lot of needs in her life. And so Ginny started responding to some of those needs because that's what Christians do. And more and more. And at some point, she had to recognize this is a tumbleweed. She became, it became very clear to her that God was telling her, one of your ministries is going to be caring for this woman. And that's just, you know, you've got all these other things you think you're doing that's ministry, but this, one, this one's now yours. And what, five years later, this one's now hers. I bet two-thirds of the phone calls my wife gets during the week are from this person. And sometimes it's annoying, but it doesn't bug her because she's very clear, this is God's calling to me. This one's one of the ones entrusted to my care. Let me give you another example. Some of you, you mentioned growing young. Um, if you're interested in, at all in youth ministry, the very best work on youth ministry in the last 20 years is a book called Growing Young. Anybody here read it? We got one that's read it. Um, massive national study. Um, I was part of the steering committee for it, so I am biased. And we did a study of hundreds of youth and youth ministries. And what they came up with is six core competencies for what it, if you want to do well in youth ministry, if you want to reach out to young people, this is what you do. And at one point, they tell a particular story that's kind of become a paradigmatic story. It's a story about a, woman, a man named Lee and a woman named Patricia. And, you know, that's fine. But the reason the story's in the book is it's actually a story about my daughter. Um, in, the, in the book, it's just about a girl named Elizabeth. But Elizabeth is my daughter. And um, it was one that we used to tell during, our, uh, during the growing young, and it became part of the book. And I'm going to tell you that story, and then I'm going to tell you how I used it in my congregation. So when my daughter, you know, you've heard of kids that, that um, run away and join the circus. Well, my daughter ran away from the youth group. She had no interest in the youth group anymore because she wanted to join the adult choir. So as a 14-year-old, she stopped going to the youth group and wanted to be a part of the adult choir. She's a vocalist. And so they said, fine, you can be a part of the adult choir. And so every Wednesday night, I would get in my car, and I'd drive my 14-year-old to church, and then come back at the end of the time. Well, after a couple of months of this, um, Lee and Patricia called us up and said, we drive right past your house on the way to choir practice. Can we pick her up? Now, Lee was in his 80s, and Patricia was in her 70s at this time. And I said, sure. So Lee and Patricia would pick her up and drive her, and drive her home. And that was really just carpool, except one thing. Along the way, Lee and Patricia listened to my daughter. And my daughter liked nothing better than to, to being the center of attention. And so having two adults listen to her was just great. And they loved her. And over the course of a couple of years, they, you know, they became kind of attached. Well, when my daughter was 15 and a half, um, my wife was diagnosed with very serious cancer. She's OK now, but for a while there, it was really touch and go. And my daughter really didn't have a place to process that because everybody that she knew was affected by it, except Lee and Patricia. And so those rides to and from church on, sun, on Wednesday nights became a place where she could process what was going on with his, her mom. Well, fast forward to when she's then graduating high school, when she's about just turned 18. Um, that May, she made a Mother's Day card for her mother. She made a Mother's Day card for each of her grandmothers. And she made a Mother's Day card for Patricia. Because she said, you've been a mother to me. And then my daughter goes off to college. And when my daughter would come home from college, she would often be pretty exhausted. 
And so she, you know, lots of college kids go out with their friends and stuff. She wouldn't really do that. But she always made a point of seeing Patricia. Well, during um, the time she was at college, oftentimes we'd be at the patio drinking coffee, and Lee would kind of sidle up to me, and he'd go, how's our girl doing? And he acted like he had ownership for my daughter. And you know why he did? Because he'd earned it. So what did I do with that story? I told that story to death. Every time I got a chance to preach or teach, you know, um, at my church, I probably only preach about six or eight times a year, but I would teach at least 26 Sundays a year. We had adult ed, and I would, so I, would, I was teaching quite a bit. I made a point of telling that story over and over and over again. Why? I wanted that story to go viral in my congregation. I wanted every single person in my congregation to know that story because here's the implication of that story. What does it take to help young people? You have to be willing to do two things, carpool and listen. Well, that I can do. I don't know what to say to young people, but at least I can listen to them, and at least I can provide a carpool. You didn't go, you know, one of the things we do in, in, um, of, in Growing Young is we talk about the importance of developing intergenerational relationships. You didn't announce, we need to develop interrelational, intergenerational relationships in our church. What did I do instead? I said, we need people who are willing to carpool and to listen. If I had said, I need you to develop intergenerational relationships, you know, people are going, I don't know what that is, but, I, but that's beyond me. Can you drive and can you listen? Well, yeah, that I can do. What I did is, remember we talked about having experiments on the margins. Little first steps. I don't ask my people to make giant changes. All I ask them to do is to take the next faithful step. I don't ask them to make giant changes. I just ask them to take the next faithful step. Because people go, that I can do. And then I give them a next faithful step after that. And then a next faithful step after that. And they look back and go, dang, look at all that change we did. But if I'd ask them to do the change, it would be too much for them. I plant a little language, and then I invite them to live into it. I tell them a little story, invite them to see themselves in that story, and to live into it. I tell them a little story and invite them to live into it. So the first question we asked, and how are I'm doing okay. The first question I ask is, who are the people entrusted to your care? People entrusted to your care are people like the people on the margins of your congregation, the tumbleweeds, that kind of thing. The second question is, what do you listen for? What I'm going to argue is you listen for the longings and losses of those people entrusted to your care. The longings and losses. What do I mean by that? Why is it hard to be human? Why is it good to be human? Or another way to think about longings and losses are the things that keep people awake at night. Think about this. You know that moment when you put your head on the pillow, but you haven't gone to sleep yet, and all the stuff of the day comes rushing in? The worries that you have, the hopes that you have, the conversation that went really, really well and you're so excited about that you, re you rehearse it and reminisce about it for the next 10 minutes. Or the conversation that didn't go very well and you spend the next 15 minutes figuring out what you should have said. Do, do you know that moment? M am I the only one? Y you all know that moment. How would it change your preaching and teaching if you knew what that moment looked like for the people entrusted to your care? If you knew what that moment was, if you knew the things that they laid in bed at night thinking about, that's your preaching agenda. We tend to think that when we preach and teach, our job is to teach doctrine. Well, I don't actually have much interest in doctrine except this. The gospel is God's response to the human condition. And the reason the doctrine matters is because God paid attention to what it's like to be human. 
And if I'm just telling people what to believe, it's boring and uninteresting and not really re very relevant. If I'm starting with why it's hard to be human and then talk about the ways in which what God is doing is inviting them into something that can transform their lives, then that's worth my time. You don't know what to say until you've listened long enough that you know the longings and losses of the people entrusted to your care. You know, the title of this book is The Innovative Church. And remember I told you about, you know, at the beginning that I understand you're tired? If I just handed you something that says, it's time for you to innovate. You're like, yeah, can't it just be time for a nap? How will you know when you're ready to innovate? When you have listened to your people long enough that you yourself have been transformed by what you hear. You're not ready to innovate. You're not ready to create change until you yourself have been transformed by listening. Until you've been transformed by empathy. Because if I have listened to my people long enough that I carry inside of my gut the kinds of things that keep them awake at night, then when I'm sitting preparing my sermon, when I'm planning Bible studies, when I'm doing the things that it means to be church, that's what I will carry with me. Yes, sir. Why are you sorry? I'm struggling a little bit. Oh, good. I like the fact that you're struggling. Tell me more about it. Well, I'm I'm so, so what you're saying is, let's say that there's like concentric circles. We'll call them Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other parts of the earth, just to pick a, a phrasing. Um, and there's like this concentric circle. And there's the insiders. And then there's the people that are on the margins. And then the people that are so outside that they don't even know we exist. <laughs> is that what you're talking about? Yes and no. I Say some more then. Those, those, those if, if I can be a little specific. Be as specific as you like. So I have a church that has a zip code uh -huh. and an address. Mm -hmm. And there are people two doors down. That don't know. That don't know. Mm -hmm. And they need to know. Jesus died for them. And, and we, we have gone to them. We have talked to them. But we're obviously stuck in a 1950s paradigm of, of evangelizing that doesn't work anymore. And I've been telling my people it doesn't work anymore, but I still don't know how to make it work. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you. I'm going to say the next faithful step may well be to help your insiders change so that when you get the outsiders in the door, they don't run and hide. Because right now what happens is on a lot of our churches, if we get an outsider to come in the door, they're going, yeah, we're not coming back. So we have changes we have to do internally before we're ready to ex um, experience people externally. And oftentimes when people are, when I'm talking and I start talking about changes on the inside, they go, oh, what you're interested in, just you're just interested in the church and you're not interested in the outsiders. No, I'm actually really interested in the outsiders. I just don't want to make them run away and hide. Uh, because I think, well, well, can I be blunt? In my congregation, there are a number of outsiders, that if we invited those outsiders to come into our congregation, they would find our congregation, what's a polite word for inhospitable? Um, it would be very difficult for them to hear the gospel because it would just seem so strange to them because we would be so caught up in serving them steak that they would go, you don't even know I'm a vegetarian. And so, let's keep having this conversation today because we aim for the same thing. We want those outsiders. But I think that it may well be that we have to do some internal changes before we're ready for the outsiders. I, I, I keep thinking about planting and watering. Um, I am... 
you know, there are people that have green thumb, there are people that have a brown thumb, and there are people that should just not be around plants. <laughs> I am very good at turning over soil. And so I can be the manual laborer who works for my wife in our garden. But once things are planted, the only time I'm allowed near them is when I put mulch out because she doesn't want to have to carry the bags. Other than that, I'm not very good at planting and watering. But what she has taught me is that she needs to spend at least a season tilling the soil before she plants the plant. So we converted about a third of our lawn um, into a garden during the pandemic because my wife basically thought, what else has he got to do? He can at least dig. Um, and so I dug out all the grass and all this stuff, and I'm like, okay, is it time to plant? She goes, no, the time to plant is in October, but we've got months until then. Here's all the things we have to do to prepare the soil. I think there's a bunch of stuff we often have to do to prepare the soil in our congregations. So let's you and I keep having this conversation today because I think you're right in what I'm aiming for. Or what you're aiming for is what was I think is a good idea. And, and, I, and I wanted to say I'm stuck on those people in, in the mainstream because they don't want to accommodate. Yep. Let me tell you a story. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the third thing. So, because it goes directly to your point. I said, what's the first question? Who do we listen to? Those people in trust structure. What's the second point? What do we listen for? Longings and losses. The third point is how do we listen well? In a moment, I'm going to talk about listening with empathy, and that's how we listen well. But one of the things that I'm going to tell you is that empathy cannot want control. Empathy cannot want control. I hate that sentence. That sentence comes out of being the parent of a, of a middle schooler or a high schooler. Let's say my high school daughter would have come to me. You know, she's 28 years old now. She's not coming here with anything. But, um, but, you know, when she was in high school, she came to me, and she's trying to tell me about why life is hard. And she doesn't understand that what she's doing is she's explaining that she's a stereotype and that every other human being has gone through this when they were 16 years old. She doesn't want me to say, oh, you're a stereotype. Here's what everybody else found helpful, which is everything I want to do is solve her problem. I want to control the outcome. I want it to become the thing I want. And the moment I want to do that, it becomes very hard for me to express any kind of empathy. Because I want two things. I want to be deeply empathetic, and I want to decide what I want her to decide. And so I have to decide I'm going to do empathy first. And when she tells me it's time, then I can tell, tell her what she wants, to, what, I, um, what, she want, what I want her to know. And let me give you a congregational example of empathy cannot want control. I was working with a congregation in the Pacific Northwest. It was a congregation where uh, the, we were especially working with the church board. I can't think of anybody on the church board who was under 70, except one guy named Zach. Everybody else on the church board was over 70. And the church was trying to figure out, what are we going to do next? Because, well, we all know that we're probably not going to live more than 30 to 50 more years. Um, and eventually, you know, we're... And so they wanted young families to come to church. And the reason they put Zach on the board is because Zach had grown up in the church. Zach was 32, something like that. Zach and his wife came every Sunday. They brought their kids. And the church feel, felt like they were all raising these kids because they would run, you know, they just adored these kids. But they were about the, they were the young people in the church. And so they have decided church leadership begins with listening. And they had listened to a bunch of people in the church. And they had commissioned Zach to go out, and because every so often people would come to the church that were, you know, under 40. And Zach was supposed to go listen to them. And Zach was actually starting a Bible study in his group, that, or in his, at his home, that he wasn't really telling anybody about, but it was a bunch of young couples that were coming. And so at one point, uh, one of the mothers in the church turned to him and said, 
tell us about your people. We, we, you know, basically, they said, your job then is to invite these people to come. And he hemmed and he hawed, and, and finally he said, you know, I don't know how to say it. He goes, if I brought my friends to the church, and if they just talked like they talked to me, they would so freak you out that you would explode, and then you would drive them away. And this mother of the church said, no, 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 you know, kindest, gentlest person, we want to listen. And after about five minutes of back and forth, he goes, okay, let me tell you a story. He said, if you were to gather my friends together, and they were just to have a conversation, it is possible that as a normal part of conversation, a phrase would come up like gender fluidity. And he paused. And they didn't freak out. Wow, well, that's a good sign. And then finally one of them said, what's that? <laughs> so he started to explain that and he got maybe three, four sentences into it and one of the elders just thundered and interrupted and said there is the kingdom of, the God, of God and there is the kingdom of this world and you have brought the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of God and he wouldn't be interrupted and he spent 10, 15 minutes just filibustering about how terrible it was to have used such a phrase in the presence of the fellowship hall at the church. Now, remember, how did this conversation start? Zach said, if I bring my friends to church and they just talk like they normally talk, it will so freak you out that you will explode. And in order to prove that it wasn't the case, he exploded. Here's my question for you. Did Zach bring any of his friends to the church? Zach didn't. But Zach still kept doing his Bible study. And, you know, his own, you know, and, and he, he and his family felt um, very cared for by the church. And the pastor would often come and visit the Bible study. But they made sure that those two groups never talked to each other. When I think about what you're saying, Joel, I keep thinking, who needs to change in that story? The guy that was thundering. Why did, it, why did he thunder like that? I would argue it's because he was probably afraid. And how do I meet his fear? On the one hand, I want to meet his fear with condemnation because he deserves it. Because what did he do? He shut down somebody who was genuinely trying to communicate. But I also want to figure out how to meet his fear with empathy. Now, over the course of the next couple of months as I worked with that church, I tried that. I failed. What I mean by that is the empathy only made it worse. In that the, it felt like the, the conclusion he drew from that was, see, I was right all along. And what it had is he had such a deep well of fear and such a deep well of anger that in my just two months with him, I wasn't going to make any difference in his life. So this really nasty part of your job, Joel, is that you are dealing with a group that desperately needs to change and desperately doesn't want to change. And what do we do about that? How do we help people change who desperately need to change and desperately don't want to change? I don't know. What, what, what's, what, how would you distinguish the two? Because the way you said that makes it sound like compromise is a bad thing. Forgive me. Um, no, I'm not challenging you. I just want to make sure I understand no, you. No, no, no. Forgive me. Because, because, because I know that there are folks who don't want to accommodate on things that truly don't matter. Mm -hmm. things that do matter. 
Amen. Amen. In case you're wondering, every single one of you is Joel. Every single one of you have people in your, that are entrusted to your care who just don't want to change on things where it's like, oh, come on. And every single one of you have people in your care who would like to give up on something that we can never give up on. You know, you keep saying, I'm sorry. Like, you're apologizing for... The dilemma that you experience is the dilemma that every single one of us experience. Well, part of the struggle is who gets to decide? Exactly. I mean... So I will, I, will, I will make a confession to you. I've taught at two theological schools. I taught at Claremont School of Theology, and I've taught at Fuller. Now, if you know anything about the way schools are calculated, Claremont School of Theology is one of the three or four most liberal schools in the nation. And if it were not, it would race to catch up. And I said that at the time when I was at Fuller, I mean at Claremont, and they said, yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's, that's who their identity was. Yet, I'm an evangelical. So they had to debate in the faculty, are we liberal enough that we can have one evangelical? And they said, well, yeah, okay, one. But just don't let them teach theology. And then I was teaching theology. And then I went to Fuller. But Fuller's this kind of odd place that we are evangelical, but many of the evangelicals in the world don't recognize us because we are theologically conservative and socially liberal for theologically conservative reasons. We read the prophets. And when the prophets said, widows, orphans, and aliens in your midst, we took that seriously. But that makes us strange. So I have been in places where I had to make very clear distinctions between what do I think of as uncompromising and what do I think of as I don't care. Pick whatever you like. And I have made badge calls at times. If I look back to on who I was when I was 35 years old, I would say that guy was wrong on some of those. I'm 58 years old right now. I bet the 70-year-old version of me will look back and pat that 58-year-old on the head and say, you had no idea. Yeah, yeah, bless your heart. Bless your heart. And so I don't want to come up off as the guy who has the answers. What you describe about sitting in the tension of that pain feels to me like both of the joy and the pain of ministry. This is why ministry is hard, and this is why ministry matters. Who else in our society is trying to sit at that place? Our society is so divided, and we are the ones that are trying to stand for something that can be different. And gee, it's hard. And so I don't want to minimize anything. I think you are doing exactly the right thing. And my job is to help give you some positive options. I can't give you the answer to say, if you follow these three steps, things all will go well for you. Matter of fact, I think if you follow these three steps, it will, might get worse. Sure happened to Jesus. I can't promise that it will go well for you. Remember I talked about my grandfather covered with all that ook and muck and oily residue? I can promise if you're doing it right, you will be at times. But I can tell you that the harvest is plentiful. That God will give the increase. And that that's all I can promise. I can teach you to plant and water. I can tell you that God is faithful. And I can tell you at times it's going to be much harder than you thought. That's all I can do. Because that's all that scripture can promise. Can I say a little bit more about empathy? Do I have time before lunch? Can I tell one more empathy story? You don't mind if we, if we delay lunch for like three minutes while I talk to you about empathy? 
You remember Erica, our friend, who was working with the middle schoolers? One of the things that she was deeply interested in was empathy. And so what she did is she gave her, her little team that she worked on empathy training. And you remember that time when the parents came because they were so interested? And the, but before they did that, she did an empathy training with the parents. And much of it is stuff that's in the book, and I can let you read that. But I want to tell one story that what she told those people that I just think is golden. This didn't come from her. It came from one of the adults that volunteered with her. The adult had been spending a lot of time listening to young people. And she said, I have learned that I'm never allowed to listen to young people without a bottle of water in front of me. Why do you need a bottle of water? And she said this, every time I'm tempted to say, yeah, but, instead, I take a sip of water and I say, tell me more. Because over and over again, when we meet people that we don't agree with, we want to say, yeah, but. Whether it's people that are young people who we think, no, 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 you're just, you know, life would be so much easier if you would just learn this lesson. Or if it's older adults, maybe, that are stuck in their ways. Or maybe it's, you know, I'm that person sometimes. But whatever it is, whenever we want to say, yeah, but, and stop listening, take a sip of water, tell me more. And that tell me more will change everything. Because the more you can listen, eventually you yourself will be transformed by empathy. And when you yourself are transformed by empathy, and they see that on your face, it creates a connection that will change everything. If you're interested in learning more about empathy, there's a wonderful little four-minute video that a woman named Brene Brown created. Anybody here know Brene Brown? If you just Google Brene Brown video, uh, it'll come up. It's about four minutes long. It's animated. It's about a, about a bear in a... In a what looks like a deer or an elk. But what she talks about with empathy is this. She says that um, empathy is about feeling what the other person is feeling. Sympathy is acknowledging what the other person is feeling. And sympathy actually creates distance. So if Clara is talking to me about pain, something painful, and I say, I acknowledge your pain, and she doesn't feel like I've really connected, it actually creates a distance. If whatever she's talking to me about, she can see that it pains me, that creates a connection. So let's say, Clara, here's a 15-year-old girl who's telling me that she has just been dumped by the only boyfriend she has ever had. I myself have never been a 15-year-old girl. So how could I possibly understand? But I have had things that I desperately wanted and lost them. I have to be willing to conjure within myself, go into myself, and remember what it was like to lose that thing so that I can feel on her level. And if she feels that I feel it, we have a connection. And if we do that enough times, it buys me the credibility to be able to say things to her that no one else can say. When are you ready to challenge your people? When you have been transformed by empathy for those people.